Tubals in a China Shop is brought to you by these great companies that are giving us money to let you listen to their stuff. Bullshit, Kyle. We make this show. We make this show. You and me. Tubals in a China Shop is brought to you by us. <laughs> Someone's got to pay the bills, Dan, because it's not our trading. <laughs> <laughs> All right, roll them. Immersive technology has long been thought of as something that is primarily used by gamers and other entertainment applications. Billions of dollars have been spent on advancing the components that make up the technology, but it is still considered niche. Is it a technology that is in search of an application or just a killer app? To help me answer that question, I have with me today Mark Sage, the Executive Director of the Augmented Reality for Enterprise Alliance or AREA. Visit mauser.com slash empowering dash innovation to listen to the full episode. You are listening to an entertainment program put together by a company called Financial Ineptitude. Anything said on this show is not an endorsement or professional advice. Would you really want to tell a court of law you were suing us because you thought taking financial advice from two idiots on a podcast put out by Financial Ineptitude was a good idea? Really? Clown hat smiley face. Hello and welcome everyone. Welcome to the China Shop. Get on inside. We're opening up for special store hours today. Joined by the amazing team at Orderflow Labs. I'm Shopkeeper Dan. With me as always is Kyle, creator of FinancialNeptitude.com. Kyle, on a scale of one to the Cookie Monster, having a seedy tour affair with Mrs. Fields Cookies, how excited are you today? Uh, uh, I am brownie excited, if that makes sense. Like, you know, when you get that, that whiff of the brownies from the oven... And like you're, you're just like ready to dive in. Ooh, that's pretty excited. I would say, I would say it's up there. Yeah. My wife doesn't make brownies. Oh, oh you need a new one. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kyle's clearly our Marty McFly. I'm the bald high school principal, and we're proud to welcome to the shop Chuck Berry's cousin holding the phone up to the amplifier, Leo. Hey, what's up? How you doing today, Leo? I'm good. How are you? Doing great. Are you ready to go back to the futures? <laughs> I'm ready. Let's dive on in. Gigawatts. Great, Scott. Going back to the futures. If that don't suit you, turn it off down. Gonna be a market loser. Order flow labs. Gonna make a big splash. Slurry joking. Leo ain't talking no trash. Got auction theory. General queries. When the market move in, wanna see it clearly. Keeping them charts and working that dime. Profit like a lover that you gotta turn on. We're back. <laughs> yeah yeah it's definitely harder than i thought it'd be <laughs> oh definitely <laughs> oh fantastic okay so leo any big news coming out of order flow labs you want to share i don't think there's huge news we've been working very hard on bringing ninja trader to ofl where you can use the free version of ninja trader and not have to buy their lifetime edition mm. that is almost ready to go. I've been seeing the tweets teasing in that. Uh, that looks pretty neat. What's the? Why is that such a? Why is that hard to do? Just out of curiosity. Well, so the w the lifetime edition includes things like volume profile, delta, you know, some information from the footprint chart mm -hmm. that does not is not included in the basic or the free edition. Mm. And so our developer. You know, when they wrote the code for the lifetime edition, they can use that existing code for a volume profile. Okay. Or they can use the existing code for a footprint. And so what he had to do is go build his own <laughs> and then use the data from that to incorporate to our studies. You've got a really good coder. <laughs> He's very good. You guys got any other appearances coming up? Any other podcasts you, uh, you want to shout out? Okay. So here's something exciting. You guys ready for this? Oh, sounds exclusive. It is, very. On September the 18th, the CME is launching a new product. Huh. And that product is going to be based on, you're going to be able to put a binary trade that will say, you know, at Globex Open, we'll give uh, four strikes above and below the current price. I think four, I'm not 100% sure. Mm-hmm. And you'll be able to say, I think the market's going to trade higher tomorrow or lower tomorrow at the close. 
and the risk mm-hmm. will be uh, $10 for a $20 gain. Really? So it's the ability to express your view on uh, the market with one simple contract. It's, it's literally just up or down. And uh, there's no theta. It's, there's no options Greeks involved. Uh-huh. Although, you know, if let's say you have, hey, we're going to close above 3980 and it's like, you know, midday and we're up at, you know, whatever, 3975 or something, mm-hmm. you may get a bump in what that contract is worth. And so you can sell it, you know, in the middle of the day or whatever. And you, that means you can also buy them and, you know, sell them in the middle of the day. Wow. So it's it's a new uh-huh. it's a new um, offering that's coming from the CME, and we are going to be pretty heavily involved in helping promote that with a bunch of other um, individuals, including Anthony Crudelli and a bunch of people on FinTwit. You'll see about it, I'm sure. That is that is really interesting. So you don't have to worry about trying to get your entries right or any of that other stuff. It's just uh, all or nothing. Do you think you're going to close higher or lower? And, you know, you can obviously risk more than $10. Mm -hmm. um, But here's what's cool. If you lose your trade, Mm -hmm. there's no commissions or fees. You only pay fees or commissions when you have a winning trade. It sounds like a bookie bet then. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. Yes. And I love bookie bets. Bring the gambling. (laughs) Well, so they call it event-based contracts for a reason. Yeah. Because... The way it's starting out is you're you're basically betting on the close mm-hmm. of the next day, but then they will introduce things like you'll be able to bet on unemployment, on FOMC decisions, on any news event <laughs> that is deemed worthwhile. Wow. Okay, that's exciting. Yeah, I think it will be very interesting to see you know, how the trading community uses this contract and, and what the reception is. I'm really curious to see how the odds shift after they first come out. Right. Because you're saying it's like a two to one, like if you, it's $20. If you, it's two to one. If you risk 10 and you win, you collect 20 plus your original or just 20 altogether? 20 altogether. So it's okay. a two to, it's a, oh yeah, wait. Yeah. Yeah. It's two to one. Two to, that sounds like pretty good no. odds for an above or below. I guess it depends too on where they set the marks, but it will be very interesting to see how they trade. You know, I was talking to someone about it and he was like, yeah, you just, you know, place your bet and then hedge it with puts or something. Right. Um, you know, or sell premium against it or I don't know. I'm sure people will figure out like, um, early adopters will probably figure out a decent uh, tradable edge against Mm -hmm. just trading it and hedging it with other stuff. But I think it'll be interesting to see, you know, is is this something that takes off or right? Um, you know, whatever. Or does it bankrupt the CME? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're bankrupting the CME. No, no. <laughs> that's like that's like bankrupting Ken Griffin. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> there is something to be said about those new. Like, I wish I can go back in time, like a two thousand years, and like be a gambler then. Like knowing what I know about statistics and probability, mm-hmm. and like because you know the games out there that they were playing back in you know that time, the the probabilities weren't really studied. So I mean, you could there's edges already built into the game where if you just knew how math, then you'd be better at it than everybody else. Right. But when a new product comes out, I'm sure they got some bright minds thinking about it. But there's going to be some stuff they missed, possibly. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, should we uh, should we dive into today's topic, building a plan? Let's go. So, if uh, people have been following along with us for the last, uh, what has it been three months now? Like we've gotten through kind of risk management, equity curves, the math, how to collect the the data to to see what uh, see how well you're doing. And then we moved into market theory. We talked about how the markets move to from balance and fair value. Uh, Flary was nice enough to give us some different trading ideas. Uh, then with Job, he came on, talked to us about volume profile and how the inventory is accumulated, and distributed, and what that even means. Uh, so now uh, it's all about trying to put all these pieces together and come up with uh, an actionable plan and and try to make some goddamn money. The old college try, <laughs> or at least prove that we can make money. <laughs> I mean, we've done a lot of work here. We need to start, you know, putting out some some P and L. Right? Some point we got to pay the bills, right? Yeah. 
So how long did it take you when you uh, first started learning to actually like put on your first trade and, 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 and like actually make actionable decisions on the information that you spent time learning? Well, I did things backwards. So, you know, I started out trading, trading options and, and like common, you know, stock, like single name stocks. Mm -hmm. And when I was like, started to get interest in futures, I was like, Oh, well, I'll just use, you know, TD Ameritrade and I'll just trade like futures on there. And um, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, just, I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, I like you have some ideas how to trade because it's like you know trading options in stock, but it's it is a lot different um, mm -hmm. in the futures world. Um, just besides you know simple support and resistance, like drawing that kind of stuff, which is obvious. Mm -hmm. So I built my own routines and process after really already have been trading and trading the futures for quite a while, which basically means I lost a lot of money and then I learned and then I still lost a lot of money and then, you know, started to figure things out after, I don't know, a year, year and a half or so. It's funny you say that you did it backwards, but that seems to be the path that most of us try to take, doesn't it? Well, I don't think anyone approaches trading as like, all right, well, like a typical job mm -hmm. that you would go to school and you would learn and that learning process would take a year and two years maybe for like a trade right mm -hmm. and i i mean like a like an electrician that has a trade right right you know that would take two uh, two years two and a half years before you go to apprenticeship before you go and get you know your full license and you're doing your own thing or like medical school where it's you're in for six years or eight years um right before you actually know what you're doing and so I think people rush into um, trading in the sense that if it's so accessible, you can open a, an account with any with a broker and be like, you know, money deposited and platform up and running in like a week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then you're like, all right, I'm ready to make some money. But you don't do that as, as somebody who wants to go be a doctor or somebody that wants to go be an electrician or somebody that wants to go be a teacher. Right. Yeah, you don't just slap your grandpa up on the table and say, okay, <laughs> let me cut that appendix out. <laughs> right. <laughs> let me watch this YouTube clip just one more time. Yeah, yeah. 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 All right, I'm yeah. ready. I'm ready. Yeah. So I think like going through that process before you actually start trading uh, could be significantly beneficial because one, you'll come to the market with a, a much better understanding of how a, actu how a market actually works. Mm-hmm. And two, um, you'll probably lose less money when you start. Really? Isn't that kind of the goal? Isn't that really the goal yes. of risk management? Lose yes. less? Yes. But I think people like I, myself included, um, you know, you come in thinking that you're going to be, you know, maverick. <laughs> right. And uh, you're not. Right. Most of us end up being goose. <laughs> Yep. Yep. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to go there, but you went there. So. I'm drowning. I'm drowning. <laughs> that was the call sign I always wanted. Yes. So, so then, like, what does your process look like then? Like, how does your how do you how do you prepare for the day? What do you do pre market? Um. So I have a pretty set basic key points that I write down pre market. Like, you know, as I sit down at the desk, I start looking at certain things. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Some of those are like relative volume. Uh, what was the overnight range? What does the overnight profile look like? That's price. You know, some of the TPO stuff that you learn from Flurry. Mm -hmm. um, you have volume profile uh, from the overnight session, um, similar to what you learned from Job. What news events are out that day? So I don't really trade news necessarily, but I want to be aware of. If a big piece of new market news is coming out, then I want to know about it because I don't necessarily want to have a position on. Yeah. Or if I do have a position on, maybe it's like I just want to be down to runners or whatever. Right. So I just want to know um, what is coming out that day um, so that I'm aware of it. Then um, I start to map out some of the key levels that I'm interested in besides what we print out automatically. Mm -hmm. uh, from an OFL perspective. So that's like back to the TPO. So your balance areas, um, your LVNs, HVN, um, you know, some of the longer time frame targets. So like, I'm, um, you know, like the Joe weekly pivot 
targets are something that I'm constantly writing down, like, hey, you know, like this is a good target for where we're at right now. Mm -hmm. And then um, after I write all of that stuff down, um, you know, I've just gone through like a mental framework of, all right, so, you know, relative volume is higher or lower today. And it's at what level? And I think there's some information that I use from that to figure out, like, you know, how aggressive am I going to be? What type of volatility do I think we're going to have? Um, you know, the over and overnight range is going to give you a little bit of that information. Mm, okay. Key levels that I'm looking for, news events, you know, yada, yada, yada. And then after that, I write a little bit of a summary of, like, what do I think the market's trying to do? And, you know, then summarize that into a, more of a non-biased view of you know the market is attempting to you know auction between these balance areas and you know if we get a break from the balance area then obviously we're going to look at being in balance and we want to trade in that direction or something like that mm -hmm. so i'm always trying to figure out like do i think the market is attempting to break out of a range stay in a range and then what's my game plan um if you know, if that happens or doesn't happen, because what doesn't happen is often just as important as what does, right? Uh, so, like, uh -huh. what's the market trying to do, and is it doing a good job of doing it? Okay. Um. So, I just write a quick summary. It's not a, it's not like a four-page paragraph essay or anything. It's just a, <laughs> hey, if we see this, I'm looking for this. Um. You know, like if we're opening at an extreme low at the open, well. What I want to see to if we're going to continue to trade in that direction is I need to see sellers like aggressively selling right off of the open. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're likely to, you know, have some short covering or or maybe some buyer step in, you know, because it's so far out of range or value or whatever. Um, some of those things you, that you likely talked about, right? So yeah. that's what I kind of put down so it's like i want to get it i have a few key levels what i think the market's trying to do and then what i need to see at the open at the opening print um you know to like get involved and you know figure out like the market's trying to do this it's doing a great job of it so i'm gonna get on the train or it's not doing what i thought it would do and now i'm like eh, let me wait and see first before i just start jumping on so if uh, the market doesn't do what you're expecting or plan for, then it's kind of hands off in that scenario and reevaluate. Like, do you go back and like do your assessment again at that point, or do you maybe just call it a day, or do you just try to uh, do it on the fly? Um, so I don't necessarily call it a day. Um, I'll just wait and evaluate what is happening in real time because mm -hmm. what I think. The market's trying to do and what the market actually does are usually not always in line right <laughs> right <laughs> yeah so yeah. when when that information when i'm wrong in my assessment of what the market's trying to do and then it doesn't happen then i need to sit back and gauge all right well, what is happening right mm -hmm. and i think that's where like is a strong a, a delicate balance between having a bias going into the day and trading with a bias. Right? Yes. Yes. I, I can't, I can tell you and uh, many times that I've come in thinking that the market was going to go down and then not being able to get off of the short idea and just get right. run over right. and over and over. <laughs> right. So when the, when you think the market's trying to sell mm -hmm. and we open and you don't see sellers and aggressive sellers by that means, Mm -hmm. then that's a sign of like, oh, hang on. You might be right, but you're not right now. Ah. And so you need to wait. Right. Like maybe maybe we're opening at the lows of the overnight session and there's going to be a little bit of an inventory correction before sellers really are willing to re-engage. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's just pure panic. And as soon as the market opens, like, you know, the selling is continuing and that's what you need to see to really get involved right away. How important are the levels that you come up with uh, in your pre-market? Are those the only areas you're looking to trade or are those just the initial points that you're watching? No, they're just longer term areas of interest mm -hmm. where I think that either could be a target for runners or 
um, a reaction if we go to that area, mm -hmm. right? So if we come up to an LVN that I think is significant on the volume profile, one, if I have a trade that I'm targeting to that area, then like I'm just looking to take my final profit or runner off of there. Mm -hmm. And if I'm flat, then I may look for that as an opportunity to lean on to trade, trade, um, take a trade against. Right. So that's the, the pre-market routine then. That's like what you do when you're like starting the day that we just kind of talked mm -hmm. about and how you kind of adapt that as you go along. What, what are some of the checks that you have for yourself to like, if the plan's not going according to plan, for lack of a better term. Like, <laughs> <laughs> plan's not going according to plan. <laughs> yeah. How do you key that into yourself? Like what sort of checks do you have in order to like tell yourself like, hmm, maybe I need to take a minute, reevaluate this or... Or the other way, like, hey, this is going great. Maybe I should, you know, size up on some of these ideas. I mean, that's all really done in the moment. Mm -hmm. And it's just the awareness of, I think the market's trying to do this. Here's <laughs> my good. areas of interest. And if I see what I think the market is trying to do and I have those areas of interest to lean on, then I'm trading that plan and I'm trading in that direction. If that doesn't happen, then... I'm a little bit of, well, let me wait and see. And so that wait and see could be, I'm waiting for 15 minutes. It could be 30 minutes. Um, it could be 30 seconds. And it's really just like a reset of like, okay, I thought I would expect to see this, you know, or in order for the market to continue to go in this direction, then I need to see this in order for me to jump on the train. Mm -hmm. um, and if that doesn't happen, I don't see the activity I'm looking for, then I may just wait and for um, like an intraday type of structured trade to set up. And what I mean by that is, all right, so if my initial plan was off and we're doing the opposite of what I thought might happen, then I'm waiting for like an intraday setup versus what I think. So if I think the market's going to sell off at the open and I'm looking to take like an opening range breakdown and we don't even come close to like that setup, mm -hmm. Or let's say I take that, like that setup does come and, you know, it, it works a little bit, but then, you know, I get stopped out on runners and then we just like go straight bid, um, you know, straight up. Right. Then I'm going to be like, oh, something, you know, like we're not doing what I thought we would be doing here. And so let me wait for something to set up. And so that would be in that scenario. Well, now I've shifted my mindset from I'm looking for this breakdown to I'm looking to re, uh, get on a rebid. Right. So like for me, that's a buy sell zone, mm -hmm. you know, and so like we, we, um, you know, we're bidding out of a spot and then we make an impulsive move. I'm looking to join that move. Like I want to be, you know, buying that, but I don't want to buy the high because it's just not my style. I know there are great <laughs> breakout traders that can do it, but I'm just, it seems like every time I do it, it doesn't work. Um, <laughs> that's actually a good point. I want to touch back on that later. Yeah. So I'll just wait in that scenario for an intraday structure to set up. Um, and that would be, you know, now I'm switched from like, I think the market's going to, you know, we're going to go lower at the open to, all right, well, we've gone higher. So, you know, obviously the, the participants have shown interest in, you know, bringing this thing higher. So I need to figure out a, a good mechanism to get on that train from a risk reward standpoint. And for me, that's, you know, utilized in the, like a buy zone in that scenario would be just a retracement mm -hmm. or a pullback from that impulse move higher. How many different like setups do you have that you can choose between? And like, I'm going to assume that us as like starting out are going to have a much simpler toolbox than maybe you would. I mean, mine's very simple actually. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. So I have like the opening, I have a few opening range things that I look at. Mm -hmm. Um, so a 30 second, five minute, um, and then 30 minutes. So I look at like what a period did. Um, then obviously like we have our tools. Mm -hmm. So I use primarily for my execution, um, is the Joe pivot. And so like, that's going to help from a bias standpoint, you know, because we know that that's really an analyzing, you know, prior volume profile and like where inventory is sitting. Mm -hmm. And so if there's pressure on inventory in one direction, then obviously, you know, I want to trade in that direction. Right. You know, so I lean on Joe Pivot quite a bit for intraday. Um, and then 
buy sell zones are a big part of my um, strategy just because it's something that I've, I feel like I'm very comfortable with the trade setup. Right. And basically the trade setup for me is waiting for the, you know, participants to show their hands. So I'm not like trying to catch the, the nut high or low. Um, I'm trying to, you know, if we make a low, then I want to buy a retest, not all the way to that low, right? Because then the right. closer you get to the low, then the more likely it is to get taken out. Notice that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's a sweet spot for me where, you know, the market will kind of rebid and reoffer from um, once we've made an impulse move low off of a low or a high. Mm hmm. And so for me, that's where I lean on. And then you combine that with what you know from a volume profile standpoint or a TPO standpoint. And, you know, that can be, uh, we've got a, a reoffer spot at a little LVN, a little LVN. Right. Because typically they, um, you know, these zones line up from a volume profile standpoint of like, there's usually a very quick, fast paced move. Um, and that fast paced move creates an LVN. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the retracement of that impulsive move, um, you know, between like 55 to seven, 65% or so usually lines up with a nice little LVN. So you have a little bit of volume structure to lean on in addition to just price action structure. Interesting. And then as far as execution tools, um, you know, my favorites, are like most of the people in OFL, the EAD and the Dominator. I love the Dominator. <laughs> yeah, it's it's great. Um, so it's like that, and then obviously, like like everyone else, I'm using the time and sales and the DOM and you know all that other information to help with that execution piece of like where and when. You know, I know where I want to engage generally from a zone, like an area, mm -hmm. um, but then execution. You know, is that EAD firing, the Dominator firing? What am I seeing? Like, that's going to that's gonna point me to, all right, well, yeah, now I'm really interested and I'm going to look at the DOM and the time and sales and, like, figure out, like, is somebody, is there, like, are they, you know, stacking the offer pretty good, uh, you know, hitting the bid or whatever? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, that's that's when I'll get engaged. That's actually, I think, one of the, the struggles I initially had uh, when this thing first started uh, um, was there's a difference between being interested in an area and having confirmation and actually taking a trade in that area. And that was something that I think I've spent the last three episodes working on myself, mm -hmm. trying to figure out like, okay, just because we're in this area doesn't mean that I want to take a trade there, but what do I need to see in order to justify putting the risk on at this point? Right. And that has been, I think one of the biggest boosts to, to the, uh, uh, I wouldn't call it successful yet, obviously, but uh, <laughs> the improvements that I've made since we started this. Yeah, I mean, look, nobody knows what's going to happen next, mm -hmm. right? We can use pattern recognition to help us identify where we think the best risk reward to engage in. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that as soon as we get to that area that you're just automatically aping in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Or at least we shouldn't. We can come to a rebid box. I call them rebid boxes. Mm -hmm. And there could be just nothing but selling, right? Yeah. So what does that tell you? Well, there's no one there to step in and buy this thing back up. And so why should you? Right. <laughs> I think I like, finally had the realization that like, I'm looking for areas that other people are seeing. Like when I find a good zone based on volume profile, TPO, like I, I'm hoping that other traders see that, but then I'm also now I got to watch and see are other traders seeing that and are they acting on it? And if they are, right. then I should jump in. Right. What, what's the saying that we use then? Don't want to be the first one over the wall. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Never, never. <laughs> I wasn't volunteering to store in the beaches at Normandy. So <laughs> I'll sit on the back. And wait uh, the <laughs> I mean, that's the whole reason or the impetus of using order flow. Right. To trade. Right, mm -hmm. you are observing the other market participants who have way more money than you, <laughs> um, and you're seeing all of them. You're seeing everyone interact because it's a central book. Are you trying to tell me that my two micros aren't doing anything to move the market? No, sorry. Oh, 
Damn it. Okay, but my three micros are, right? Yes, correct. (laughs) But you're seeing the interaction, and you're using that information to help you figure out when to engage. Mm -hmm. Versus like, you know, moving averages, right? Yeah. I know lots of people that use moving averages and, you know, have success. But if we come up to a moving average, there's nothing that I can look at that, that says, well, you know, buyers or sellers are really engaging here. It's just right. a moving average, right? And you can develop setups off of that. That's you know, and just you know, take the trade and you know, put the risk on it, and you know, risk management and all that stuff takes care of itself, and that's fine. It's another way to trade. This is just another you know, order flow is just another way to trade. How how important is the risk management to a thing? Because it's there's a lot of people with a lot of different strategies, but the thing that seems to be in common is the risk management. Well, the game is to stay in the game. Ah. Uh-huh. <laughs> so if you if you get taken out of the game, then you can't show up tomorrow and trade. Right. 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 So you have to. That has to be paramount to anything else. Mm-hmm. Look, we have setups. We have uh, information that we can derive from the market because that you know it's market generated information. Mm-hmm. So all of that, you know, gives you some clues to, you know, the tea leaves of, you know, what the market participants are doing. (laughs) And then you have your trade where you execute. And if you don't have proper risk management and proper, you know, risk to reward on your trades, then you won't last very long. Can you expound a little bit on the proper reward part? All right. Well, if you have a risk reward of one to one, which means for every dollar you win a dollar, mm-hmm. like dollar of risk, you win a dollar, so you net two. Mm-hmm. That's a one to one risk reward, right? Right. For you to be profitable or successful with that venture, and you need to win more than fifty one percent of the time. Yep. Uh, likely more because of commission. Right. Right. So maybe you need to have a fifty three percent win rate to be you know basically like barely profitable Mm -hmm. having a 53 percent or 54 percent win rate is good can you do that with higher uh reward to risk so then one let's say you go to 1.5 to one so every time you win every time you risk a dollar you win a dollar and a half so then now you're winning two and a half dollars for every dollar risk Mm -hmm. so if you keep the same trade win percentage then your equity curve goes up. And you guys talked about that with Flurry, the equity yep. curve piece, right? Yep. Yep. So you need to have appropriate risk to reward um, for your trade setups based on who you are as a trader, uh, what your personality is, um, and things like that. Because if you're going to have, you know, if you're aiming for like a three to one or a four to one or five to one, you know, some of these larger risk to reward you're going to be in a trade longer, Mm -hmm. right? And if you're an anxious person and you're like, just, you know, you want to book your profits, like a lot of people, yep. (laughs) then you probably shouldn't start with a, you know, five to one risk award ratio. You probably should start smaller and build up to something that has a higher risk to reward ratio. Right. And maybe that means like scaling out to where your last, you know, entry, you know, has a four to one or five to one based on the original risk. But you're already out at most of your position at that point with your Correct. profits protected. Right. Yeah, because that is something that I think a lot of people do struggle with is the the, the scratching or the the moving their stops too soon or, or taking profit too soon. I really don't think that's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, I, I saw firsthand how it was affecting my performance. I think I went right. from uh, uh, like a one point two profit factor when I was doing okay, but still, you know, moving stops too fast, taking profit too soon. To uh, I think a one point eight six is what it was last I checked. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it, it makes a huge difference in your bottom line. You don't even realize it because you think, oh, I took the risk off, I'm good. But right, <laughs> but you're not doing that when you're taking full stops either. So now you're taking less. When you're getting rewarded and you're still getting the same the same hit every time you lose or you're wrong. Yeah, and how can you know if you need to adjust your strategy if you're always moving your stop around? That's another great point. 
Like if you enter into a trade and you think it's a great setup, mm-hmm. and let's say maybe like like it's a great setup, you put a um you know your trade on. Maybe you have to trade to get taken off because you've hit your first take profit. And I think a lot of people do this. They you know they'll hit their first take profit and they'll move their stop. <clears throat> maybe your average like I trade NQ right, so maybe your right. stop is somewhere between like fifteen um, to seventeen points or fifteen you know, 13 to 17 points or something like that. Mm-hmm. So you go up to your first take profit, you take profit. And then what do you do with your stop? You're like, Oh, well, you know, like the trade's going in my direction and it's feeling good. So I'm going to go ahead and move my stop up, you know, to like five points, you know, below entry. Mm-hmm. And what, you know, what a lot of markets do is they, you know, they, they, they rotate around or squiggle around um, before, you know, the actual move kind of starts. Right. Um, and I think oftentimes that means it comes back to your entry and dances around your entry and goes a little below it. And, you know, and then it goes. So and confirm. <laughs> and so then, you, <laughs> you know, you get, you get stopped out and then the, the move you were looking for went. I actually did that with an options contract on uh, Monday. Uh, it was at a good level right at the top of balance and it was rotating and I said, Oh, it's going to move up or down out of here. I'll get crazy by a straddle, get a call and a put and, uh, can't lose. Right now yeah, both got stopped out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> true story. True story. <laughs> so yeah, I'm a big proponent of, you know, people have different viewpoints on this. So I'm sure, you know, you can tweet at me later. <laughs> I'm a big proponent of, you know, taking a trade, managing the trade according to, you know, your your plan. But hopefully that doesn't mean like you're moving your stop too early. Mm-hmm. Like the, there's got to be a structured way to do that, right? So really, it's all about being able to collect good data in that case, then, right? So, so how does your journal look like? What do you, what do you keep track of? Like when the day's ended, like, how do you, how do you assess the day? How did it go for you? So the one thing that I've done over the past couple of months, which has helped me tremendously is I go, um, you know, I pull, you know, to my execution chart and I just turn on show order fills Mm -hmm. and I review that every single day. And I think two things happen there. One, you will see yourself entering a position exactly where you want to be, you know, kind of right before a larger move is about to take place. Mm -hmm. Uh, Two, you are taking profit way too fast based on the setup. So that's one thing I noticed is I was like, if we're talking about getting the meat of the move, Uh I was just getting like the ankle. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like the whole, you know, I wasn't even getting like the whole part of the bone. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, using a chicken leg reference here, but <laughs> <laughs> um, do chickens have ankles? I don't even know. I don't know. Dan, you have chickens. Yeah, they do. It's just a little higher. Okay, cool. All right. So I just made that up, but it made sense, I guess. It um, works. It works. Yeah. So you'll notice that, Hey, I'm getting into the right spots and I'm, I'm taking profit way too early or, um, you know, me, I scale in and scale out of a a position a little bit, you know, so maybe I'll look at a chart and be like, you know what? Like I'm really, I don't need to be this aggressive at, you know, scaling in, scaling out at this area. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, part of me is like, there are certain areas where you want to be a little more nimble. Um, for me and my style and then others where it's just like you know clear as day you know put the trade on let it go to full you know targets or whatever and really don't mess with it too much and i notice you know we uh weaknesses in my game just by reviewing um trade fills just just by looking at the just the overview of like a single chart and just showing you where your fills were at right the other thing that it does is it brings you back in because in the moment like during the session you know in the middle of the day you are in you are locked in yeah and sometimes that locked in is you're emotional Mm -hmm. right and sometimes you know those emotions can be good for you or bad for you and so if you're trading emotionally or, or revenge trading um in the moment 
if I were to try to bring logic into that, you know, it's not going to work well. No. Right. (laughs) So after the fact, I can go, you know, hey, I'm really executing in these spots really well. And these areas are where I'm getting myself into trouble. And then, you know, you can't really address a problem unless you know what it looks like. And so then, like, after reviewing that, you'll see a pattern of like, I keep getting myself into trouble in these areas or like when the market's doing this. And the more and more you review that, the more and more you're able to, in the moment when that's happening, go, hold on. (laughs) I've seen this story before and I know what's happened and I reviewed this. And so I'm going to be a little more delicate or I'm just going to be flat out flat or you know, whatever, like I'm changing my approach because I already know what's about to happen. And, you know, because based on my, you know, going back and looking at the data, when this happens, I do not perform well. Yeah. (laughs) Right. (laughs) (laughs) So having that awareness and bringing it to light, Mm -hmm. you know, after the fact will help you in the moment realize I'm not trading well, like I'm just, I'm emotional, you know, I'm just angry or mad or, you know, all the emotions that you can have. And when this has happened before, yeah, this is, you know, like I just, you're able to recognize that in the moment, like insert, you know, all of that logical stuff that you think about after the markets close. Right. And stop yourself from making those trading mistakes. That's fine. That actually kind of reminds me a little bit of like what I used to do when I used to play poker when I was younger. I did try to play it a little more seriously, but whenever I do something that I know was not a smart move or not, you know, proper risk management, I would actually say it out to myself and be like, I know I should not be doing this, but I'm going to anyway. (laughs) I can't tell you how many times I've said that at the poker table, (laughs) but it, it definitely helped, uh, Like, it's a good place to start. (laughs) Like, at least you're acknowledging that this is a bad habit. And if you can start doing that, then you say that to yourself enough times, then eventually it'll start to click in your head that, (laughs) wait a minute, (laughs) every time I say this and I do this, it doesn't work. Maybe I shouldn't do this anymore. You know, there's so much logic in that statement. It's it's unreal. (laughs) Yeah, like you said, the logic doesn't always, uh, doesn't always win the day <laughs> what do they say you uh, everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face that's yeah mike tyson <laughs> yeah so i mean that's what it is though you show up to the market every day and get punched in the face yep and you know we're talking about trade plan right now um you know putting your plan together and you just got to realize that you're going to show up and you're going to get punched in the face and your trade plan is going to probably go out the window on certain days Yep. Yeah, I don't like to be surprised, so I just throw getting punched in the face into the plan. <laughs> just, <laughs> I just plan to lose today. <laughs> and the, you know, getting punched in the face doesn't mean losing money. It could oh, just mean, yeah. yeah, you know, you're you're off, um, you're you're pissing against the wind, or just off your game in general. You're just off your game in general. Uh, I do want to go back real quick to to what you're saying about breakouts and how you've come to the decision that they're just not for you like how did you come to that and then like how do you pick the setups like how did you understand how do you come to that understanding of your psychology so i think you have to know who you are as a person um to know who you are as a trader okay and what i mean by that is you know if you are a person that's very high strong you know very um um kind of like ADD, even I don't have ADD, so I can't, maybe I, I, I'm unqualified to speak on that, but <clears throat> I would imagine somebody with ADD is very, you know, can focus on like 30 different things at one time and totally all make sense. Um, I have a little bit of that in my personality um, where the more information that I look at, sometimes the calming, like it's a little calm, more calm for me. Oh, interesting. And so it just like, That's one of the reasons I think trading makes a lot of sense for me is because there's, you know, there's a lot of data to, to look at and I never get bored. (laughs) Right. Um, But going, going back to like who you are as a person, if you're nervous, Nelly, you know, and that's like your default stance, then you you probably want to trade um, one way versus being like a Chad, like a breakout Chad guy. Right. It's like, (laughs) I don't care what's happening. Like we're breaking out and I'm just going to buy the high a day. 
it's like we're just getting on the train and going. I assume I assume Chad's a douche, right? Yeah, no, nah, man, Chad's a good dude. Is he okay? Yeah, just a- no. I think like you just need to know who you are. We're, being a breakout trader doesn't does not equate to being poor at risk management. No, no, I love breakouts. Right. It just means that you're comfortable buying the high of day and selling the low of day in certain scenarios, mm-hmm. right? Because you're looking for that range to get extended. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I look at a chart and I go, we are literally at the high of the day and I'm really not com- comfortable, you know, putting risk on at the high of the day thinking we're going higher. Right. Um, it's just not in my my personality. Because it's been beaten into me through education and market education that I think most futures traders or most traders in general are start kind of start from a uh, mean reversion type of a trader Mm -hmm. to then build in some of the breakout trading mechanisms into their game. Okay. Um, Because I think for the most part, a normal market and by all means nothing about this year is normal in my opinion but (laughs) normal market you know has a lot of balance and what i mean by balance is just mean mean reverting sessions where we've made kind of an impulse move from a longer time frame to an area and we're just digesting for quite a while before there's another move coming and so normal markets tend to mean revert you know and you don't want to be breakout trading when no, like 70 percent of the time it's a mean reverting market right no that meant, yes but this year um has been more of like a level to level and a breakout breakdown market than anything else and so you have to build in these skills of breakout and breakdown trading um which is something i'm not comfortable with but you know, it's something that I've been working on building into my game. I just have a different way that I've approached it of, you know, it, you may look to sell the low of day. I will look for that low of day to be broken mm-hmm. and then try to sell a retest of that area that was broken. Ah, uh, I see. So it's still my way of like, not necessarily just straight out buying the higher low of the day, but looking for, you know, a retest of the original breakout. Yeah. I don't even remember where we're going with this. Uh, trading is a personality. So <laughs> <laughs> I think it was, uh, just discussing like how you kind of came to that decision about yourself. Like why, like you came to the realization that breakouts weren't really for you. I came to that realization because one, the market taught me that, you know, breakouts don't work that often. Mm-hmm. And I learned that by losing money, trying the breakouts. And then two, um, throughout all of the education and you know process that you go down to learn how to trade, you know you want to position yourself in a certain manner that not necessarily is not necessarily always uh, in the breakout move. So I like the breakouts, but I think the biggest problem with them is that there's not as much opportunity for them. And I think that goes right what you're saying about the the seventy percent of the time the market ranges. Yes, and. Part of the journey that I've been on and uh, through the the process of talking to all of you guys was learning how to be more selective with that and actually figuring out a way that I think is actually now something that I can action on and trade and feel more confident in as opposed to what I was doing beforehand, which was just, oh, this looks like a stops might be here. Maybe I'll do that. Right. (laughs) I think when you guys are talking to Bigfoot soon, right? Uh, yes, uh, we got to get him back on the schedule. We had to push that back, but yes, we will be talking to him. All right. So like Bigfoot is a breakout Chad. Ah, uh, okay. So Chad is definitely not derogatory. No, he talks about <laughs> breakout trading, like, um, probably better than anyone that I've talked to or heard talk about it. Mm-hmm. And so I think like he has some things that he looks for from a breakout standpoint that really quantify when he's looking to take the breakout or not. Okay. Yeah. That should be really interesting. I'll have to make sure I make notes to ask him about that. Um, well, we're starting to get, uh, towards the end of this thing. Maybe we should start to, uh, sum up and then do some Q and a. 
So we've kind of talked about like your process, uh, your psychology, how you kind of pick those setups, uh, some of the different mistakes, the journaling, like, like how, how would you recommend somebody new, like build their plan? What, what uh, sort of the key things should they have in there? How many setups do you think somebody should be starting with? Um, any, any good tips to, to help us get started on building our own personalized trading plan? So I think there's a lot of information out there. There are a lot of tools to look at. I would keep it very simple to start with mm -hmm. and then expand and contract what you use for your plan. And what I mean by that is, if you have a particular piece of information that you think is important because you talk to a buddy or you watch a video on YouTube or you read a book, but you already have your, your plan, um, you know, you can add that piece of information to your plan and then go back and do some, you know, do some hindsight and, and after a couple of weeks and go, all right, is this piece of information or this view of how I'm looking at the market actually helping me? Mm. Because if it's not actually helping you and making an impact to your day or helping you make a decision, mm -hmm. then it doesn't belong on your plan. Are there any hard and fast rules that uh, that you think that any new trader should have, like as far as whether it be like uh, risk management, like where to start out as far as your risk reward or when to stop for the day? Like any like like okay, this is like lost three in a row, like my day's over. So I think. The most important thing to your risk management is being able to show up the next day, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you definitely need to have a hard daily loss limit that totally takes you out of the market. Okay. Because if you blow that, then you're likely doing more damage to your account than you need to. Yeah. If you're down $2,000 on a day, you're, you're likely not trading well. Um, right you know for most for most like retail traders right yep yep you know if you're trading two micros it's, it's probably not going well if you're doing two thousand dollars <laughs> <No. laughs> <laughs> um, okay so you need to have a daily loss limit i think that you know it's a hard stop out that keeps you out mm -hmm. right i think there is also a middle ground like a, a warning sign like if your daily stop out is uh, $1,500, then maybe you get a warning to yourself at like seven, uh, 750 mm, Okay. And so you go, okay, are we good? Do I need to take a break? Am I done for the day? Am I not, you know, let me at least take a 30 minute break and see what, yeah. you know, what's going on. Just pull yourself out because usually when you're just like, if you take three stop outs in a row and you take a fourth, you know, it's just not going well. Like you're just, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. So you need to have like a dollar amount that a gives you a warning that something's wrong. And then two totally takes you out. Okay. From a risk reward standpoint, I think it depends on your setup and your personality, right? Mm -hmm. If your time frame is super small and you have a, um, a really active personality, maybe you're you're looking to be um you know take setups that you know have a one to one or one and a half to one or whatever um but you know you need to have a high a high win rate for that to be successful so can you achieve that mm -hmm. or can you expand on that you know can you start out as a short time frame trader uh, meaning like you know very small time frames and then work your way up and then if you're very comfortable with you know sitting in a trade for a long time you know you can work on a uh you know being three to one um but have a risk uh profile that makes sense based on your personality and the way the way that you um like to trade and then if you have a three to one right then you need to have a percent your percent of profitability like your trades that are pro profitable need to match that um expectancy right so mm. if you're three to one i think you can be profitable at 35 percent, if i'm not mistaken or 33 percent mm -hmm. so obviously your win rate can come down significantly and you can still make money so what that means is of three to one you're probably taking more stops than you are you know than you are if you're one to one and then you got to be able to psychologically handle that too totally but you know you definitely you have to have a hard limit mm -hmm. of I'm done for the day if I hit this dollar amount. 
Oh, as on a, uh, the upside too? On the upside, here's I don't have a personal limit on the upside. One that I've thought about into implementing, I just haven't totally thought it through yet, mm-hmm. is let's say you have a target of you know uh, $4,000 on a day. And let's say you hit that $4,000 target and it's 9 a.m., mm-hmm. right? Like you just had a great opening session. You know, maybe it's, I am done for the day. I'm, I'm ready to go. Or, um, you know, you still feel in the zone and you're trading well and you want to continue. I think that continue should be, um, you know, maybe one way to approach that is I've hit a $4,000 target. I'm going to give myself to $3,100 as a, like a drawdown. Right. Right. So now I can, I can not, if I lose $900 on the session based on this scenario, then I'm done for the day. That way you're not trying to chase it. And... Yeah. Because, you know, upstuck is like a term. Yeah. 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 I'm very familiar with that. <laughs> it's a poker thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it kind of, helps you balance that, you know, like trying to achieve more because you're, you know, you feel like you're totally in tune with the market and that is definitely a real thing. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's kind of like the runner's high, right? Yeah. Um, you just, you're, you're in the flow and you're feeling like you just have a good read and you're trading well and doing, you know, all the right things are happening. Never wake it up from the table when you're on a heater. Right. So you don't (laughs) want to put anything that hinders your ability. And those, Mm -hmm. because some, you know, those sessions can be some of the most, you know, that can make your month in one day. Yeah. And so you don't want to put a hindrance on, all right, well, if I hit $4,000, then I'm done. Well, what if that $4,000 day could have been a $12,000, $15,000 day? Right. Likewise, if you, you know, hit $4,000 and all of a sudden you lose, you know, two or 3000 you think you're going to be trading well because you've just given back that much money? Right. Um, probably not. Uh, and then last thing then, I guess, uh, as far as the plan goes, like how well do you define like your setups? Like, do you have like your setup written out? So like, um, if you handed it to like your son, like, could he, could he take that and go execute based on what, what your conditions are or, or is yours more, more generic and more feel? Um, mine's more feel. I mean, like I mentioned, I have the, the key info, like the key areas of interest Mm -hmm. that I, you know, put down, um, pre-market those go on my execution chart, you know, either like red or blue based on if I think it's support or resistance, Yep. I'll put a note next to them. You know, I'm marking this level because, you know, it's a weekly LVN. So I'll just put like, you know, 12, four, three, nine weekly LVN. Mm Mm-hmm. So that way I know in the moment when we come up to there, like, Hey, this is a weekly, um, an LVN on the weekly time frame, And, you know, I'm looking for, you know, like I could use that as a target or I could look at that as an opportunity to take a trade with. Um, so I don't necessarily have like a, a written out plan of like, I'm going to be long here, short here and take profit there. Oh, no, no. I, yeah. I don't mean like that either. I mean, as far as like, what you consider like a, like a checklist for execution almost like, okay, Mm. if it comes into a level I like, then this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for two of the three, you know, execution tools that I like, or I'm looking for this uh, volume build that looks like this shape. Yeah. So I'm looking for like, from an execution standpoint, when we get to this area of interest, I'm looking for, you know, the, the EAD or dominator firing at that spot. Mm-hmm. Um, in the direction I'm looking to trade is obviously a plus. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm looking for absorption um, on a on a footprint chart. So, like, if you have, you know, just say I I just use a delta footprint, so it's just ask minus bid volume, and that's I just highlight big size. Yeah. Um, so that it kind of stands out, and then I go to the depth of market, you know, order book. What's that? And you know the depth of market, the dom. I'm just kidding. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so then, like, I go there to yeah, you know, kind of observe like what the activity is because in NQ, you know, it's not just like you you come to a level and you just you know reverse off of it. Like it takes a while to move the boat. Yes. Yeah. Um. So I'll just watch the behavior in there and see if I think you know if I'm if I'm looking for a long right. Obviously, I want to 
I want to see um, responsive bidding in that area Mm -hmm. and potentially like absorption followed by a responsive bid. But do you have like anything that says like, this is a, this is how I define absorption? No, I just, I mean, absorption is just absorption. So I don't Mm -hmm. really have a, what defines absorption is if they're selling into an area and the price isn't moving, Mm -hmm. then to me, that is absorption, especially if there's initiation away from that. Ah, okay. So, and that may be one of the key factors that, you know, a lot of folks don't see or they'll be like, oh, look at all this Delta. And, you know, there's like, let's just say we're trading, uh, we've got, we're closed at 39, uh, 55 and three quarter today in ES, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say we're trading there right now and the market's going and there's like 2000 lots of negative Delta there, right? So that means... At that area, there were two thousand more, two thousand more business done on the bid versus the ask. Mm-hmm. Okay, a lot of people will look at that and go, "Oh, there's trap sellers." Well, no, it's not trap sellers. Mar- the we haven't moved yet. Ah, right. Mm-hmm. It's potentially absorption because we haven't moved, but it's also nothing yet because we haven't moved. We're just sitting there. Right. So just because we've accumulated a bunch of Delta, that it definitely is absorption, but it really absorption doesn't really play out until you get a response from the opposing party. So if you have 2000 lots of sell Delta at the, you know, at whatever price you're trading at, and then you have aggressive responsive bid, you know, so buyers lifting the offer, mm-hmm. you know, stepping up on the bid all of those things, then to me, that tells you that absorption was significant. Okay. Right. Okay. Because it tells me that, you know, this sellers have run out of steam. There was somebody on the other side of that trade, just willing to just take all of the business that the seller had to do. And, and then some, and then, you know, there's other buyers or participants willing to, you know, then buy it up. Right. Right. So for me, it's not, like well-defined just because like absorption specifically, you know, it's just, it is what it is. It's not like, um, you can almost just ask yourself, like if you were a seller in that area, like what, at what point would you be scared (laughs) or getting, at what point would you get stopped out? Yeah. Yeah. Or either, or yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, if you see a bunch of, if you see selling into an area and then all of a sudden price stops moving and then you have what you would think be, would be aggressive buying so sweeps you know sweeps on the tape mm-hmm. you know that's a pretty good indication that all right we're at our area of interest so we're already interested in this price um we've got some absorption which means that maybe there are some other people that are kind of interested in, in hanging out here um buying here mm-hmm. and then now we have aggressive behavior that says like all right we're like we think this is totally unfair you know this price is totally unfair so you know we're we're aggressively going to push away from this. So, so you don't necessarily have it completely written out like a five-year-old could understand it, but you definitely have a full understanding of what your execution criteria is for sure. Totally. I think that's safe to say. Yeah. And I do think that is an important part of a good trading plan too. Yeah. You have to know what you're looking for. (laughs) Right. (laughs) 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 It only took me six months to learn that. (laughs) I think the problem with like the checklist idea, and I'm not saying that that's what you're suggesting. No, no. But I think the problem with the checklist idea, and I've 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 interacted with other traders that view um, have this viewpoint, and they're mostly like the engineering type, right? Like the yep. people that are very smart. They want um, because they think you know um, everything is in a vacuum, right? They think that you can put the market in a box or a vacuum and you can put criteria uh, for every single thing that you need to see happen before you execute a trade. Mm -hmm. And so I'll have people go, well, I have to see this, 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 and this, and this before I'm ready to execute. Well, by the time those six things have happened, we're already five points away from where you were interested. Right. Yep. Right. And so now your risk reward is totally skewed. Um, I would say my thing is more that I just want it to be repeatable. 
and then trying to simplify it as much as I can. I don't want, you know, six or, or 20 different indicators firing at the same time, because like you said, like I've, I've been down that path already. Right. But having, you know, two of four, uh, like key things like mm, that works for me. Right. If I get two of these four, then now I've got something that one, I can track two, I can repeat and three, I can collect good data and show me, is it working or not? Right. Part of that is this intuition pattern recognition mm-hmm. because you'll start to see things repeat at the at these areas that you're interested in doing you know conducting your trades, and then the the second thing is you know keeping it simple enough to where you don't have a twelve point checklist before you can move forward. <laughs> yes, it's actually a really good book I read about uh, about simplifying uh, your decision making. Uh, I think it was called Blink. I'll put a link for that in the episode description if anybody's interested in it, but. Uh, we don't have time to go into that, so I'll just go ahead and move on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dan, do we have any good questions uh, that we need to get asked here? Discord user Joel MC, longtime friend of the shop, asks, how do you decide whether a plan needs adjusting or just needs to be scrapped? Um, I think we covered that um, in the sense that, you know, like the way that I read out a plan, I try to have a, a little bit of an understanding of what I think the market's going to do. Mm-hmm. And if that doesn't happen, then it's not that my plan gets scrapped because the levels of interest are still important to me from a longer time frame. Um, but then I'm taking that time to pause and, and wait for something like from wait for something that else to set up, um, you know, from an intraday time frame to help me get me involved. Well, I, I think Joel might have actually been talking more about like a long term strategy. Like if you're I think he was talking more about like trying to come up with like a defined setup that he wants to trade. Uh, like a setup, like, like, uh, he looks at micro trend line breaks and then, um, when he sees those breaks and he makes his entry and then has a, a risk reward profile that he's been studying out. Uh, I think the question is more like when you have a trade thesis that you're trying to work out the, uh, the bugs on, like at what point do you decide like, Hey, okay, this has potential. I can I can just tweak it, or at what point should I just scrap this and move on and try to mm-hmm. find something better? Yeah, like like you, you did with breakouts, right? Um, so what I would look for is if you one like you can repeatedly draw the same pattern. So if that's like a trend line, how you draw them is important, mm-hmm. right? So you have to be able to draw like you have to be able to go through say a year's worth of charts and draw the same trend line, right? The same pattern that you're seeing. Mm -hmm. And then you want to see once you're able to repeatedly draw the same area because markets, you know, work in a fractal nature, right? So certain things will repeat and repeat and repeat on many timeframes. Um, So once you have that recognition of the fact that you, you have a pattern, it can be, um automated basically because you know you can draw it the same way every time you look at this any given chart Mm -hmm. then you go into the weeds of observing all right well what is your when you see this pattern what is your trade setup and then so going through each one of those and going okay when i see this trade setup i am taking this as my entry this is my risk and my reward is this. And what I would look for is when doing that homework, um, are you getting, you know, your is your risk reward working or are you getting stopped out all the time? Mm-hmm. Right? Because like you may have a pattern that you recognize in a market, but it doesn't really, um, it doesn't really pay that often. Right. And so what you want to see is something that is, pretty consistent and paying out. So if you have this pattern of a channel break and you have, you know, just going through every time it breaks, you know, putting the trade on, like you, if you were just doing it mechanically, uh, is it paying more often than it's not? Mm -hmm. Then that would be something that, you know, I would then start looking at implementing. Get your baseline and see what does your baseline show you? Is there potential just on a straight, simplistic, execution of this right because yeah. i have i come up with different trade ideas or different you know things that I'll, I'll look for 
and then I'll go apply that theory to a chart and just, you know, back test it uh, visually, like, you know, going back a, a year and just looking at that, that setup like over a year. Mm-hmm. And I'll realize like pretty early, you know, this is something to pay attention to or like keep digging into, or it's total waste of time. Um, okay. Usually it's a total waste of time, but every now and then you find something that seems to, you know, get a response. Like if I'm looking at a, like a, a level based off of a volume profile or based off of an opening range okay. and you see, Hey, every time we come up to this, you know, area based on something I'm looking at from volume profile or from an opening range or something, the market seems to get a, a reaction and more often than not, does it, you know, have a reaction? Well, then I'm, a, I'm very interested. If it doesn't do anything and it's just a bunch of random, you know, lines on a chart, uh, which is usually what happens, <laughs> <laughs> then, you know, it's just time to scrap the idea. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. That answer your question, Joel? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> what else we got, Dan? Uh, let's see. Uh, Paul D is asking... How often do you find yourself acting on new ideas and opportunities as they present themselves throughout the day versus just sticking to whatever you laid out in your morning plan initially? I would say pretty frequently. Um, I, you know, most of my trades intraday are based on intraday um, structure, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, my trade thesis for the day could be. I think the market, you know, we're um, going higher, going lower, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Even if that's the case, I'm not necessarily just like jumping on that train at the beginning um, unless I see the obvious. So if the obvious doesn't happen, so I'm waiting for some market structure to set up. And for me, that's like the rebid and reoffer zones. Um, before I get super interested in, unless we come to like one of those key levels that I marked. And so what I'll do when we hit one of those key levels that's in my plan is then I'll watch that pretty, pretty heavily. And that's where I would be willing to, um, potentially try to knife catch or, you know, try to top tick, which I think, you know, like from a risk award standpoint, if I'm going to like fade a big move, it needs to be from an area that I think is a significant uh, from a from a bigger time frame. Uh huh. That makes sense. So, so are you are you like paying attention to the pivots for when you make those counter trend moves? So I utilize the Joe pivot that we have within OFL. Okay. And that's really giving, like, helping with that immediate bias, um, you know, when the market opens. Um, you know, being below or above the pivot is important to me. Mm-hmm. How far we moved away from that pivot range um, is important to me. I use those tar- as t- more or less targets than I do for, like, a knife catcher. Uh, setups. Setups, yeah. That makes sense. Does does Job hold it over your head that your favorite tool has got his name on it? That's my question, not anybody in particular. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I think it does. Do you need to have the, what's Job's favorite? You need like Leo's volume profile extravaganza. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, these these are the Leo levels. Exactly. Exactly. I might I might or might not have those. Oh, nice. Nice. Very nice. Okay, JRob24 on the Discord asks, what do you do when you wake up and your entire plan is played out overnight already? I would love to know that. <laughs> That's easy because I don't write my plan out until the morning. Uh, yeah, me neither. That's why I don't write it out until the morning. <laughs> here's, a, here's, a, here's the thing, though. If you write your plan out at the end of the day and you wake up in the next day and it's already played out, that gives that's a clue in itself because that probably means there's been a significant move in the market. Mm. And so if we're talking about balance to imbalance, that may be a clue we're uh, potentially going from balance to imbalance. And so when you wake up that session and you're way out of your um, trade plan, you know, be on, be on the lookout for, you know, potential um, imbalance type of move. 
I'd also say too, uh, pat yourself on the back because it uh, looks like you were reading the market very well. <laughs> For sure. You, you may not have been able to take advantage of it at that point, but uh, you definitely were onto something. You should definitely go on Twitter and yes. do the touchdown dance. Yes. <laughs> and then show it, post it and then tell everybody how much money they could have made if they only followed you. <laughs> <laughs> That's like Twitter 101. Yeah. <laughs> okay, last Discord question. Does anyone at Orderflow Labs have last names? That, that's my wife. My wife has been asking me that. I I think so, but um, I'll have to check. <laughs> I have a last name. Men of mystery. You know, I don't know if the other guys have last names. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's okay. I noticed they're not even on your website. <laughs> I mean, I could. we could all post them, but... I don't know. So, okay. It was a yes or no question. Answer is yes. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> just, you don't get to know. <laughs> Kyle, when you're printing money every day, you got to stay a little bit of anonymous for safety, right? Yeah. I still uh, don't understand what the Twitter haters are on the, on the OFL website. You don't? No. Is it just people like bad mouthing you or like, how do you get, how do you get to become a Twitter hater? Well, it's just like trolls, you know, I, I've not seen anybody troll you guys. Oh, it happens all the time. Does it? Yeah. Oh, man. Okay. I'll have to go dig through that. Next time you get one, tag me. <laughs> <laughs> They'll tag you back. Hey, you found one. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, God, that'd be hilarious. Well, they just like, you know, they're just, they just come on and like, an obvious troll, you know, thing is like attacking us because we have something that we sell. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, cause it's like, Oh, if you sell anything, you're like the worst person ever. Yeah. You should give everything away all the time. A hundred percent. Everything should be free. Yeah. Right. That's how capitalism works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I keep petitioning the CME for when I buy an options contract on Friday, why not do a buy one, get one free. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's like the obvious one and yeah, that's fine. It is what it is. But um, yeah, there's others that it's like, you know, we'll post like an idea or trade setup and you know, somebody will be like, well, where's your, where's your entry and where's your exit? Like, okay, well, it's just an idea, man. Like, I don't know. Just, <laughs> right. Yeah. And also how's that going to help you? <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> yeah. Just tell them, send me your username and password. I'll log in and trade your account for you. Yes. <laughs> That's what most of us want. You know, people just want to get on and, you know, try to ruffle the feathers. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're all bastards. I'll say it for you. <laughs> Bastard-coated bastards with a bastard filling. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right, Dan. Did we cover everything? I think it's going to end up being a longer episode, but I think we got through it all. You guys are going to have to cut this down. I don't know. I don't know. Might have to, maybe we'll have some bonus uh, excerpts that we can post for uh, the people listening on the Discord. I don't know. I th I think it was pretty all point content. Uh, there wasn't really any meandering. I don't think there's much to, yeah. I think it's all pretty good. You guys think Flurry can talk. I know, right? I guess I, I, guess I just went for it, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I just assumed it was so hard to get you into the shop. We had to keep you talking and get it all out now, and just in case we, we don't get you back again. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I don't think it was that hard. I think Flurry just really liked it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he, he just coming back. No, no, me again, me again. All right, Dan, you want to wrap us up so we can let Leo get back to, to doing what he likes to do? Yep, yep. All right, folks, thanks so much for sticking around to the end. I'm glad you did. I know I learned a thing or two. Hope you did as well. I know Kyle learned a lot, and I hope Leo learned a lot about how awesome it is to come on into the shop and hang out with us for a bit. And why you should do it more often. Yes, more often, more often. <laughs> Unfortunately, good things do have to come to an end, and we're going to have to kick everybody out. The good news is, though, we will be back at you soon with some exciting episodes. Until then, happy trades. Bye, everybody. Bye.
Two Bulls in a China Shop is an entertainment program, and all thoughts and opinions expressed in the show belong to the hosts and not of any company. They are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual or on any specific security or investment product. It is only intended to provide entertainment about stocks and the financial industry of trading. If you make trades based on what you hear in this show, you assume all risks for those trades. Don't miss Sleep Number's biggest sale of the year, where all smart beds are on sale. Right now, save 50% on the Sleep Number 360 limited edition smart bed. The bed's so smart, it senses your movements and automatically adjusts to keep you both comfortable all night long. So save 50% on the Sleep Number 360 limited edition smart bed today. Hurry, free delivery and special financing on all smart beds through Labor Day. Special financing subject to credit approval. Minimum monthly payments required. See sleepnumber.com for details.